Chain Stacks on the radio. Oh, yeah. I love that. Shall, shall, shall we play a game? Why, yes. I believe we shall. Oh, I got a live one here. <laughs> Getting geeky in Little Rock. It's Shane Plays Geek Talk, a journey into the things we love. I'm your host, Shane Stacks. Thanks so much for tuning in, whether you're listening to the live show on 101.1 FM, The Answer, at 1 p.m. Central, or if you're listening after the fact by podcast or on Krypton Radio on YouTube, no matter how you're listening, I just love to have you as, as we just have fun on this uh, journey into the things we love as we get geeky and all that cool stuff. This is Geek Talk Radio. It's like all the other talk radios that you know out there, political, sports, religious, uh, fix my car talk radio, but it's geek talk radio. So we just geek out and uh, have... There'll be no car fixing here. Yeah, we will not. Yeah, we're manly men, but we don't fix cars. That is that is returning to the show, Doug Tim Naple, who has done so many things that it would literally rupture space-time if I tried to list them all in just a minute or two. But Doug uh, is... The creator of Earthworm Jim, also Bigfoot Bill. We're going to be talking about Bigfoot Bill today. He's a award-winning TV producer, writer, supported animating. Uh, th- what what else do you do there, Doug? That I'm forgetting. Animation, to mention. animation, video games, and graphic novels. So Is comic book. He's also, I believe, I know you set the record. Do you still hold the record for crowdfunding on Indiegogo for a comic book? I do. Uh, yeah. Indi- Earthworm Jim raised eight hundred and sixteen thousand dollars on indiegogo last year yikes yeah that was a lot of money it's not like it goes in my pocket people okay that's not what i get paid yeah people don't understand how how things work yeah it's it's an expensive i make very expensive books expensive they uh i don't know if you saw blake northcutt was joking recently evidently she discovered that her net worth is 18 million and she's like, wow. well, yeah. So she's like, news to me. Uh, and if people don't know, Blake Northcutt is a is a, is a, a, a she writes novels and comic books. Great, I'm a huge fan. She's a rising talent, as they say, a rising star. But yeah, she was she was amazed to discover some site was reporting that her net worth was it was either it was either eighteen million or one point eight million. She's got to go cash that in. Yeah, but regardless, it was orders of magnitude beyond what her actual net worth is. Yeah. So. I mean, Doug. I'm sure you make a living, but a lot of a lot of people, a lot of people in your industry, you gotta love it. You do it for the love of it. You know, That's you're true. not you're not out on a yacht. You know, and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's not a rich man's game unless you yeah. really just blow something up. And I've never been on the good end of that deal, right. where all my things that blew up the biggest, I always had the smallest percentage or or ownership of. So right. I get to enjoy kind of the heat that it brings but not necessarily the financial rewards so i'll take the heat too because that's good for marketing you know right. future things but you have to love it i mean no one gets good at doing comics for the money because at the very least because when you first do it you're not really worth being paid so bad at you're it, earning man. your earning your stripes yeah paying so your I'm, dues I'm very successful at what i do and i i always i'm very blessed and very fortunate when I can pay my bills every year. Yeah. You, you've, you've touched on this before in some previous uh, interviews we've done. And again, thank you for coming back to the show. It's a real pleasure, oh, pleasure. to have you Shane, back. I'll, I'll hang out with you anytime. Cool, dude. Uh, and I'll hang out with you anytime, man. I, one of the things I love about you is that not only uh, do you produce some genuinely geeky stuff that I love, but you're a man's man. You know, you'll talk, uh, you know, obviously you're a devout Christian. We have great conversations there. Um, you're sort love of Jesus, Jesus, love my wife, love my four children. I right. like my guns. Yeah. <laughs> you like them? Yeah. I like my, I don't love my guns. I like yeah. them. It's a priority. Well, I mean, yeah. My single issue is going to be pro, for life. Yeah. And, and, uh, guns are, are down a bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're, 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 it, it's just with people, sometimes when people talk about their guns, I'm like, I'm like, dude, get a room. You're making me uncomfortable. You know, I mean, yeah. like, uh, it's like it's getting a little steamy in here. So yeah, you're even a country boy. You're even in the south. Our, yeah. our guns. Yeah. You know. I was just teaching my son. He's sick. I, I was teaching six. He was he's six. I was teaching him some more gun safety over the weekend with a BB gun. That's oh, that's and BB guns are great. I yeah. buy all my kids BB guns. Those twenty four dollar days guns that you can get at a sporting goods store. I got all four of yeah. my kids a BB gun. 
and you, it's great for gun safety. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. It's like teach, you know, and, and it, it's almost a trope or a stereotype to bring this stuff up now because it always comes up in the discussions. But, you know, a few decades ago, everybody had a gun. You know, the, yeah. the kids were going to high school with gun racks in their back. You know, so it's, it's not a gun problem. It's a heart problem. There's a people yeah. problem out there. So oh, that's true. That, yeah. now that is true. All yeah. my kids are uh, responsible with their gun handling skills. Uh, yeah. We have three boomsticks in the house. Yeah. And uh, and so I try and get them out to the range to shoot every once in a while. You know, I, and, and I agree, you know, we, we that that right is also self, you know, it's self-evident should be able to have right. a gun. But but people do go crazy about it. I'm just kind of going, why is that your number one? Dude? Yeah, gun? What's it? yeah. Well, I'll tell you. You know, I'm a reasonable gun owner. Uh, I I was able to find room for the howitzer, but I stopped yeah. there. I stopped yeah, there. My, my over know. under grenade launcher. <laughs> it's purely for home protection. Some guy comes in my home. You don't want to come in my home. Everyone yeah. in my family, yeah, knows what they're doing. So that aside, yeah, yeah. yeah my satellite based particle weapon platform. <laughs> The particle weapon platform is Particle's only it's only for uh, entertainment and home defense. That's all. The giant thing in, in Akira. Is that <laughs> yeah, like, exactly that thing. Yeah. A to blow Euclidean particle accelerator. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. To blow uh, Tetsuo's yeah. arm off. Yeah. So, all right. Anyway, I'm gonna reel us back in here. So. <laughs> satellites don't kill people. people kill. Yeah, satellites don't kill people. The big red don't press this button. Uh, people kill people so anyway oh my goodness what what we were talking about was that uh let me what 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 the heck were we talking about well we were we were talking about uh you know uh most people that that are in your industry you know you can make oh i remember what we were talking about you had come on before on a previous interview and you're talking about one of the reasons that you love crowdfunding because we're talking about making a living off yeah. of what you're doing. Uh, and one of the reasons that you love crowdfunding and Indiegogo and all of that is because it, it helps you be Teflon from the uh, forces, the ideological yeah. forces that are at work in the entertainment industry and in, yeah. you know, in so general. Cancel so, culture is, yeah. is kind of a nickname that we call right. it. But specifically, I have dangerous views. That is, I put. I believe Jesus is the son of God. I believe the Bible is right. is uh, is true. Uh, I believe marriage is between one man and one woman only, and that alone will get you just comp- your career destroyed in the arts because it's right. so full of um, angry leftists. So I fa- I, I've been looking for kind of a bailout plan, and crowdfunding so far has been doing very well. For people who don't know what it is, it is uh, – Two platforms that I use is Kickstarter and Indiegogo. So Kickstarter.com and Indiegogo.com. And right now I have an Indiegogo book called Bigfoot Bill Two. So you can get Bigfoot Bill One, but you go to you go to Indiegogo.com, and that's where I that's where I make my entire living. We have just now crossed the seventy thousand dollar mark, and uh, and basically it's just in, it's an independent business where I go directly to my fans and to my readers and say, do you want to buy a book? And I go out and get it. I draw it. I write it. I get it printed with the highest quality printing in the USA that I can uh, manage. And I'll send you a nice hardbound 160 page book that the whole family can read. Let me let me stop you there and say two things. One, that uh, the main thing we're going to be talking about today is your new campaign bigfoot bill yep. too so we will be getting to that folks and in fact i've got right here in front of me doug can see it via the magic of skype i've got that. bigfoot bill one that's a beauty and that is i mean this is like coffee table worthy it's pretty like gold leafing on the cover and embossing yeah. so i'm really it's into solid. the artistry of the actual book binding well it's it's substantial i mean i could you know when and if well not when not if when that bull moose crashes through my uh, living room. I can take him out with a sucker. You could. It's One a, hit. Yeah, we, we talked about guns. That is also a home security device. If <laughs> yeah. the owner of that book hits someone in the head, and that's a weapon. They're down. Yeah, they're down. So, But the other thing I wanted to talk about, not only that we're going to be talking about Bigfoot Bill 2 today, but the quality of what you deliver. When I received my Earthworm Jim box. Yeah. And you surprised a lot of people with this. The box itself is a work of art. It was a white box with um, 
black and white cartoon art all over it. Yeah, printed yeah. art on it. I'm really, I, and I that you you got it right in that I love surprising people, right? Uh, with with entertainment, like where you're not looking for it. Let's say I, aha moment when that happens. Mm -hmm. You know, you're like, and really, I I stole that idea from C.S. Lewis. Did you? Who? Yeah, because he was probably one of the most um, crafty, like mystery type writers where he, he was really about the hiddenness of God hmm. and really about the idea that you unfold something or you turn a corner and there's something magical happening in the forest. That's the feeling that you want to get. That's what he was always going for in his works was this, this kind of surprise. And he would just call it buried in atmosphere where you you go into this atmosphere and you feel like all this stuff is real. Uh -huh. So it's very like stated like a, 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 a sequence of scientific facts. It's these kids go into a wardrobe and there's a lion named Aslan and there's a witch. And it's just like he treats them uh, like it's a historical event, which I think that's part of the magic of his world where you're just like, wow, I feel like I've been somewhere and I didn't see that coming. So even my that even translates to my packaging, where I want the packaging of the book to show that I respect the money that I get, but also that I take this craft. It, it's beyond serious. It's nearly an obsession with me, where I, I want the quality of the story and the work to, to show that I really, I really love what I do, and I and I really am fortunate and blessed to get to do this in America right now. I don't feel like it's a given. I, right. I think these these times these are rare times. So I, I draw for God, not for my draw for God first, then my fans, you know. And so I, I'm aiming. And and by the way, when I look at all my work, I still go, Shane. I'm not there yet. I'm not doing it well enough. Mm. Well, I think that's the mark of any true person who is an artist, whether they're. Prof I mean, you're a professional artist. Yeah. Uh, professional, you know, at its bottom line means you get paid to do it. Uh, but professional can also mean a mark of quality. Most professionals have a certain amount of quality. But uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to narrow in on, I, I think a true artist never thinks they're there. There, there's so many, there's so many uh, filmmakers, writers, comic book creators, musicians that people love their stuff. But on the inside, they're like, ah, I'm dying inside because this wasn't what I was trying to put out, you know, That's and because right. and it's, you know, they're always trying to hit a mark uh, that that is an internal goal for them that, you know, uh, that people don't, you know, the outside doesn't see, you know, like, and this is a very extreme example of it. There was a video game that came out, uh, indie game that came out a few years ago called Braid. Oh, yeah, I remember it, that. Yeah, it was a good one. Well, here's the thing. That, also crowdfunded. It uh it had it was a platformer that had mechanics where you could reverse time and, and things like that and there's there's a uh, a documentary out there called Indie Game the Movie and oh yeah they, I remember that yeah they that's, interviewed that's a good, it's a great documentary yeah it focuses a lot on the people that did Super Meat Boy but it also yeah. follow, talks to the guy who did Braid and who did Fez Fez uh, Fez is a wonderful platformer but anyway. Uh, the guy who did Braid was like almost fetal because he did not, it, the game wasn't received on the artistic level that he meant to put it out. And it's this massive success, you know, but he's he's actually almost, almost depressed that it wasn't, it, it was either that it wasn't the game he wanted it to be or people didn't see in it what he was trying to yeah. say, you know. Yeah. So uh, that's well, the problem is you put right. all this magic into it and not all of the magic is going to be seen. And right. that, that's another thing, by the way, that I got from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis. <laughs> he, in the Chronicles of Narnia, he was was hiding all kinds of stuff uh on a much deeper level that people didn't even discover till 50 years after it was published. Uh, right. Michael Ward, I'm talking about from his book, Planet Narnia, starts really opening up and describing exactly what Lewis was doing. Almost all of what he was doing was secretive and hidden. There's layers in that book that is, that, that is beyond just what a child reads and what right. we might read on the first, first go. And so... He would have to be frustrated, and he never told people what he put in it. So 
that's another thing is that you have to be willing to put an amazing craft into your work and not right. every in fact most people won't see the majority of what you're what you even put in there so for instance on on earthworm gym i have a page with glow a glow in the dark layer on it that maybe two percent of the, the right. readers ever found but There's oh the oh the things. delight when they see it right they're like oh my goodness that's, that's glowing in the dark right that's what yeah. you're hoping for i don't yeah. have to tell them about it you want them right. to find it one day and go what yeah and, and that's <laughs> yeah. the wonder that's yeah. how but if you tell them it spoils yeah. the wonder frustrating too because people are like they're they're online reviewing the book and reading it and they're looking at this page when there's something shiny on this book i don't know what that is and they yeah. just turn the page and, and go they the just keep going. Like, oh you almost you almost found it on the dark page yeah i mean and stuff like that is wonderful though and you know kind of back it up a little bit talking about the craft in creating something uh you know i i love c.s lewis i'm a, I'm a huge c.s lewis yeah. guy and and then I'm, I'm getting more into G.K. Chesterton. Um, yep. my, the next thing on my list is Tremendous Trifles by your recommendation. So. So good. Yeah. He's so, so quotable. I mean, there's, you know, you know, I'm following, there's a G.K. Chesterton account on Twitter that puts quotes out and just, you know, he's so quotable. Well, yeah. In fact, when you get into Chesterton's mind, you've already gotten into C.S. Lewis's heart. He was hanging on every word yeah. of Chesterton and you see it all throughout C.S. Lewis's work. A whole lot of that source was Chesterton. Chesterton. Uh, I, I have a deep love for C.S. Lewis. You know, I'm, I'm coming to know Chesterton better. I always knew him as kind of a, a whimsical, witty, deep thinker. But, you know, yeah. I'm going much deeper with him now. And, and a lot of, large part of that is is because of your influence. Tremendous uh, Trifles is a great start. Well, that's the next one. You know, I read, of course, Orthodoxy is a great starting point. And really? then uh, and then on your recommendation, I read, uh, is it What's Wrong with the World? What's uh, Wrong with the World is another good one. Yeah. That's a good one. And now I'm on... Tremendous Trifles is next. So, yeah. Do you see how Chesterton doesn't explain everything to you? He just right. puts it out there. He's expecting your mind to show up and start right. going, what was, what was that? You know? Right. And the, it's, uh, it, I think there's a stimulus there in the discovery. And after modernism came where everything's like uh, David Hume, you know, if you can't see it, feel it, taste it, touch it, it doesn't right. exist. Empiricism, which is terrible. Then everyone is explaining all these facts to you. Everything's like, let me explain it to you. Let me break it down for you. Treating you like you're dumb or like there's no um, intuition or a way that your mind can put things well, together. Well, and, on you know, I, I can't help but think a lot of church services have gone that way. That's true. The mystery has been, and there is a beautiful mystery in Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, like, yeah. like when the pastor describes, um, um, and when, when they're doing a sermon on Noah, you know, in the belly of the whale. And the pastor says, er, Jonah. you know, yeah. I'm sorry, Jonah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Jonah, Jonah's in the belly of the whale for three days. And the pastor will say something like, and you know, this is possible because we have scientific evidence. Yeah. That people have actually been swallowed by a fish and have lived. I'm like, that you're missing the point. You're missing the whole point, dude. No, it's not about, well, I know it happened. But it happened yeah. by miracle. So that you don't have to give me some natural occurring event that proves it's right well there's also uh and, and man, we're going off topic again but that's fine i mean i'll always chew the bible with you there's a man it's not in the psalms it's it's in the new testament somewhere and it's referring back to jonah and it almost implies that he might have died and then you know come back and i'm not saying that he did yeah but yeah. there's that, a mystery the, there uh, the yeah tying it to jesus spending days in the ground and resurrecting talks you know there's some mystery there is is the point but but anyway, you know, the, what I was kind of aiming at was talking about craft and the richness. And there's a lot of stuff you'll never see. You know, one of the reasons that uh, the Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth, uh, The Hobbit, it, it feels so rich and developed like you're really somewhere is because Tolkien developed an entire mythology in history before he ever wrote the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. So you're seeing about an inch of an iceberg that is like 20 feet deep. So that's why and, it feels so real. And when you compare that universe to Star Wars, you see how thin Star Wars right. is as far as the world building and the language. It just doesn't have, you know, an illiterate depth. It's, Star Wars is still neat, but it's not. Right. It doesn't feel as real as Lord of the Rings. It know? doesn't. And, and I love Star Wars. It's is what I what I keep trying to say, you know, when everyone's arguing over Star Wars these days. Star Wars 
is space opera. Yeah. It's basically fantasy, but with a science fiction coding on it. Yeah. It, it is a fairy tale in space. It is. Well, once a, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away is the same thing as saying once upon was, a time. Was your first clue. Yep. Yeah. So yep. it's fun, but it's not deep like Tolkien. And one of the, th a lot of the things that people are seeing these days, especially with the new trilogy we just had, instead of drawing on, uh, you know, all this deep, rich mythology that was already written that anybody that nobody already knows about. It's like the the Wallace and Gromit scene where uh, the dog's on the train and he has yeah. to keep laying the rails down in front of the train as it's yeah, going. Yeah, long trousers. Right. Yeah, and it's so that's what they're having to do with Star Wars now. They're having to just keep make it up as they go along, which is fine. I mean, it's still like the Mandalorian. Great storytelling. You know, a lot of fun. And I didn't hate the new trilogy. There was a lot of stuff that I liked about yeah. it. But it doesn't, the reason it feels a little shaky these days is because there is no cohesive. It's because it is yeah. shaky. It is. It does not have a firm foundation. Right. Oh, wait, I mean, you get a firmer foundation than Tolkien. A linguist. A linguist right. who is uh, writing language and history and then crafts. A, a wonderful little story. Well, he wrote drawing from all that. He wrote. He did all of that to justify the fake languages that he was creating. Yeah, you know. So he he is he's a scholar. He's a historian. He's a linguist who also happened to write fiction, yeah. and and it shows. You know. In, in anyway, we're he's he's wonderful. I'll I'll never understand how he did what he did. Because, because to me, the plot and character in that story is also amazing. It's amazing. Usually, yeah. tie to someone in theater or in film, mm. or or you know Shakespeare. You know, a pretty uh, and that was like I, for him I, to stick it like that is amazing. Something where you can still read it and just fall in love with these characters, these people. Well, I think a lot of it was because, like, I just I just discovered as much as I love Beowulf and as much as yeah. I love Tolkien. I just recently discovered that he did a translation of Beowulf. I got that. Yeah. yeah so I just finished reading that, uh, and I read all the notes and the you know that uh, it's it's really uh, you know more of the book is translation notes than it is, and he he used it to teach Old English to his students, oh. but he was a student of these old epics that had this rich drama, and I think that helped inform his, you know, whenever he was writing his own mythologies. Because that stuff, that stuff resounds on a very deep level. When you get into, uh, like, Beowulf, or if you get into, like, Gilgamesh, or if you get into, um, is it the Ring Cycle? Uh, yeah. yeah, you get it, that stuff resonates Wagner's on a... Wagner's Ring and all that, Norse mythology. Yeah, you get into some very, and very... Beautiful. Yeah, very beautiful, and I think that, that that's helped. what was inspiring yeah. him. Beowulf, the yeah. rings, the ring cycle, all the old stuff, it, and then he builds it on top of it. It was almost like a pop culture version, to, contemporary yeah. to him. Now we look at what he did as ancient because we're making on right. top of it Star Wars and Game of Thrones, kind of more illiterate versions of world building. Uh, What's the other one? Uh, Hunger Games and stuff like that, which are great. I'm not saying illegal. yeah, they're fun. They're that. escapist just, entertainment. There's nothing wrong I just with mean it. The, yeah. the shoulders that we keep standing on are thinner and thinner as we yeah. go through time. And and folks, we will get to Bigfoot Bill too. Trust me. It's a beautiful book. I, it's, it, I'm I'm drawing from hopefully deeper sources than my contemporaries are. So we will get to Bigfoot Bill too uh, here in a moment. I, I, there's just one more point I want to make. With with Doug, I don't get a I don't get a chance to talk with thinkers like Doug as often as I'd like to. I had a discussion about a year ago uh, with a friend of mine who loves fantasy, yeah, but doesn't like Tolkien, and uh, which is fair. You don't have to like Tolkien, but he's a huge uh, Brandon Sanderson fan. Okay. And there's nothing wrong. I mean, Brandon Sanderson is a great writer. He writes great fantasy. Robert Jordan. Yeah. Uh, he took over Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. Robert Jordan, I have to say, even though his prose is not my favorite, he's a pretty deep, rich world builder, if you've ever read any of the Wheel of Time. I mean, he goes pretty deep on his world I, building. I have not, but I've yeah. heard great things about him. I, I only know his name is Jordan, you know, so I don't know. Yeah, him. he's probably the closest... I've seen in a contemporary writer to going as deep as Tolkien does on his world. Oh, that's building. great. It's great. Yeah, it's, it's good. But the point is I was trying to make is my friend who's an, a, a rabid fantasy reader. He's like, man, I just can't stand Tolkien. He's like, how, how can you not love Brandon Sanderson? I said, I like Brandon Sanderson. 
Yeah. I said, but Brandon, the best contemporary fantasy today is like getting the best steak you can get at the Outback. Yeah, it's like okay. getting the best sushi in Tennessee. Right. It's good. Well, I'm saying, like, if I go to the Outback and I say, bring me your best filet mignon, yeah. it's going to be a decent, good steak. Okay. And it's right. going to be like, I really enjoyed that. And it's going to taste good, and it's going to nourish me and all. I'm not saying the contemporary fantasy nourishes me. But I'm saying it's a good steak. And it's 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 better than, like, you know, if I go to, you know. Shoney's. Yeah, if I go to Shoney's and say, bring me your, your ribeye, you know, your T-bone. Exactly. But Tolkien is like going to the five-star steakhouse that they're bringing you out a steak that's been aged for, you know. You know what I'm saying? There's but But if your tastes don't understand the difference you don't really see the difference between that steak and and you have and, and the, culturally today we're yeah. raised on mcdonald's that's right. just the way we are this is quick right. disposable stuff made to survive just opening weekend kind of spike the box right. office see if it goes viral and then dump it if it fails and move on to the next thing hoping to get a baby yoda out there the quote unquote the child but but that, the, my point you know was that there is a richness and a deepness to tolkien that it, it can be hard to appreciate, you know, yes. unless you, unless like you were raised on Tolkien and then you started, unless you were raised on the best steak in town and then you were given the best steak from Outback, yeah. you know, you don't really see the difference. So, so, so I have two problems in doing Bigfoot Bill one and two. One is I'm not Shakespeare, so yeah. I can't write that well because I too am, you know, California public school educated, doing my best here trying yeah. to trying to read and get caught up at 50 years old with stuff I should have read in high school. I just yeah. read Moby Dick when I was 40. You know? Yeah. I have tried to start Moby Dick so many times and I can't, I mean, I, I barely don't get call me Ishmael's about as far as I can Shane, get. it's the greatest <laughs> book I've ever read. <laughs> is it really? I'm, I'm telling, this is how you got to read it folks. You got to get a printed edition. So no audio book, but bi I would get big work, big letters, big words. So a big yeah. full edition. Yeah, the chapters are cut up into three page chapters. You can read them a chapter in one sitting. Right. It's 125 chapters, three pages. So I just did it almost like a devotional. I committed to doing one chapter a night for 125 nights. And, and, and it I read sounds like, day. Sounds and like so it paid you, off. When you only have to read three pages. Right. It's amazing how, how much higher your concentration can be, how mm -hmm. much funner you'll have with the, he's talking about a world builder, my goodness. It, and it really is. It's the most, and I found it strangely readable because I'm not like some smart genius right. guy reading Greek or something like that. It is, it's very readable and it's very beautiful. Well, I'll give it another shot then. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you the, uh, uh, a book that, you know, I would say is like scholarly, but I picked it up a few years ago and devoured it and loved it. And I was like, I've never read anything like this was the brothers Karamazov. Yep. And that was amazing. Yep. You know, profound. It's mm -hmm. a, that's one of the most profound books there are yep. There's so many classics that we don't treat ourselves to. So right. let's go, look, I'm going to die one day. What books do I want to make sure that I hit? It is worth right. spending time on great books instead of on, pop culture stuff written in the last two years well i think it's good to have a mix you know i like to do deep yeah. stuff yeah. like I, at any given time i might be reading like uh some non-fiction you know christian thought yeah like i'll you know i'll be reading chesterton or and but at the same time i'll be reading Dragonlance, and then i'll be reading you know my bible every day so i i, yeah. I try not you know i try to have a mix of stuff coming in you know i i never can can commit myself to the pop culture garbage the, the biggest thing that i can say that i watch is like uh, i'll watch survivor every week with my yeah. family that i my, used to be a huge survivor nerd i used to be big hot dogs yeah <laughs> uh, i'm going okay i get it this is fun this is but, it, but i i have so little t uh uh, leisure time because of my work. That right. I, just, uh, I gotta pick my punches. So I go if I'm gonna read something. Yeah, I do read uh, a lot of apologetics. So if it's an if it's a thoughtful, you know, William Lane yeah. Craig book or something. Yeah. I'll I'll do that. Or something real light and breezy like Francis Schaefer. Yeah. Yeah. I love Sha yeah. The, yeah. The Schaefer trilogy. That's another one where I put it on my nightstand and just did a mm -hmm. chapter. Chapter I, night. I read The God Who Was There, and that was some it's, really good stuff. Really that was good. And that he's was like so a modern, he's a more modern C.S. Lewis, because right. Lewis, 
and Tolkien and Chesterton were really fighting off the coming of modernism. Mm -hmm. And then by the time Schaefer came around writing in the 60s at Le Bray, he was responding to postmodernism. So there's predictive stuff in Tolkien, Lewis, and Chesterton where they see postmodernism coming. But by mm -hmm. the time Schaefer was doing The God Who Is There, uh, he's full on seeing it and addressing it in that book. He has a great grasp of the arts when he talks about this stuff. He's responding to full, the philosophy of the time. So he's a great one. And then uh, built on his shoulders are mod much more modern but thoughtful thinkers like Greg Kokel, J.P. Moreland, William Lane Craig, uh, Mark Keller, you know, great pastors and great writers. Yeah, you know, some of those names I recognize, some I don't. But man, we need to do just a separate just podcast on this kind of stuff, yeah. man. Yeah. Well, I'm, a, I'm armchair theologian, so that's yeah. a, that's my other thing that I do is I read. Yeah. I try to read, especially when I'm inking pages. I can read like doctorate level stuff, you know, and I try and really go uh, deep on it. So cool. Yeah. Speaking of, and then we'll. I'll, we'll leave the uh, the non Bigfoot Bill stuff behind after this, but you know you mentioned they were fighting against modernism and this and that. Uh, the the third book in C. S. Lewis's space trilogy, that hideous strength, was nothing but a salvo against modernism. Yeah. I mean he was basically showing what because he was he he was in the university i mean he was a professor he was oh, part yeah. of the education and, and he, he saw it coming yeah you know, and he's so predictive of what yeah. we're going through now and that is my that is probably my favorite c.s lewis work is, is that, that hideous strength? Hideous strength. Yeah. Well, that he he tells it from the perspective of you know, and it's 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 a fiction book. It's exciting. It's got you know supernatural and sci-fi elements. But he shows what happens to a university when it gets taken over by you know like just potent modernism. So yeah. anyway, okay, well let's let's get a break in, and when we come back from the break, we're going to be talking Bigfoot Bill to Doug's newest crowdfunding project bigfoot bill the first one was the shadow of the mothman what is the name of bigfoot bill 2 what's the, the finger of poseidon the finger of poseidon so there you go and it's it's a wonderful fun uh graphic novel comic book in you know in 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 book form and it's if you liked earthworm jim which you should earthworm jim's a lot of fun if you're not already familiar with bigfoot bill i can't help but think that you'll like Bigfoot Bill. It has that same fun, that same whimsy, that same all kinds of cool elements. I mean, he Bigfoot Bill is like basically a Bigfoot that wears a Kraken. So, and I mean, if that doesn't, if that doesn't get things a Kraken, I, I, I'm going to delete oh, that wow. out. That his, was bad. His kraken <laughs> is his clothing. Yeah. yeah, that is that's that is some great stuff. All right, I, we're going to break in. When we come back. We're going to be talking about Bigfoot Bill too with. Doug Tin Naple, the man, the myth, the inker, and the more. And the answer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back on 101.1 FM, the answer. Are you a fan of thrilling adventure, daring suspense, and just a touch of romance? Cursova has you covered. Since 2016, Cursova has been publishing the very best in contemporary fantasy and science fiction, retro pulp. And for you D&D gamers, Appendix N style fiction. Based in Little Rock, you can pick up their flagship magazine locally or at Michael Tierney's The Comic Book Store on Treasure Hill Road or Collector's Edition on JFK in North Little Rock. Swing by one of Michael's stores and pick up an issue or find them on Amazon. C-I-R-S-O-V-A. It doesn't start with a K, it starts with a C. C-I-R-S-O-V-A, Cursova Magazine. Check them out today and speaking of michael tierney's uh comic book shops comic book lovers head to michael tierney's local comic book stores for the newest books on the shelves plus a fantastic selection of back issues visit the comic book store on treasure hill road in little rock and collector's edition on jfk boulevard in north little rock and don't forget to click on over to the wildstars.com michael tierney knows comics in addition to being in business for nearly four decades and publishing his own comic book series, The Wild Stars, for almost as long and still going, he has written multiple columns for comics magazines and is an Overstreet Price Guide advisor. Michael is also the author of the wildly successful, high-quality, four-volume Labor of Love, the Edgar Rice Burroughs 100-Year Art Chronology. Remember, for all of your comic book needs with friendly service, make sure to visit the comic book store 
and Treasure Hill Road in Little Rock, Collector's Edition on JFK Boulevard in North Little Rock, and thewildstars.com to learn more. Tell them Shane Play sent you. And last, but never, ever, ever least, I want to go ahead and throw out some love to Game Goblins. Some goblins are your friends. Game Goblins is Central Arkansas's premier retailer of Magic the Gathering, Warhammer 40K, board games, card games, RPGs, miniatures, and hobby accessories. Call Game Goblins at 501-224-GAME or visit them online at GameGoblins.com. That's 501-224-GAME or GameGoblins.com. Conveniently located 1121 South Bowman, right on the corner of Bowman and Canis in West Little Rock, and staffed by friendly employees, Game Goblins has expanded their store size, and there's plenty of room for exciting inventory and tables for play space. You'll like that space because Game Goblins has gaming events every day of the week. For all of your gaming needs, I hardly recommend Game Goblins. Make sure to check out their customer loyalty program that rewards you based on your actual purchases. Game Goblins earns your business and keeps it. First time customers mention Shane Plays and receive $10 off your purchase of $50 or more. Tell them Shane Plays sent you. And folks, if you do visit any of my sponsors, please tell them that you hear about them on the show. That helps them know uh, that their advertising money and the relationship we've built is, is time and money well spent. Shane Plays Radio is blessed to have sponsors, and we appreciate them very much. However, did you know that you can also support the show as an individual for as little as $1 an episode? Simply go to patreon.com slash Shane Plays. Hey, welcome back to Shane Plays Geek Talk and Journey, into the things we love. We have the pleasure and the fun and the danger of talking with Doug Tin Napel, the creator of Earthworm Jim, uh, Bigfoot Bill, uh, Emmy Award, Emmy, uh, I know you were Emmy nominated nominated for the Veggie Tales. That's right. Uh, that was on Netflix, which I love Veggie. There's so much stuff I could talk with you about. I have to actually slap myself to keep myself on topic. So I'm going to do that right now. There, I just slap myself. So, well, pow, self-flagellation for the good of the podcast. What we're talking about today is Doug's Bigfoot Bill 2 project, which is in crowdfunding right now and has already uh met its goal and more but you know w- when a crowdfunding project meets its goal that is the minimum level that it needs to hit to get out there yeah. and i can guarantee you that creators like doug the more they bring in the more they do like i backed earthworm jim and I ended up getting, the box itself was a work of art, which was a surprise. It had all kinds of goodies packed in, and it just kept adding to as as, as more and more money came in. So let's let's take Bigfoot to, Bigfoot Bill 2 as far as we can to see what kind of, uh, if you were listening to the earlier part of the show before the break, the wonderful surprises that, uh, that Doug will try to work in. To, to and delivering. I'm, and I'm, I'm doing. Uh, there's a long surprise in all these books that I can't talk about, but it's there. So it's I'm there. Just saying, yeah, it's there. There's stuff buried in there that uh, it will come out eventually, but it's hidden now. You know, that's in in my love of C.S. Lewis is there. So, what, for those of you, the biggest problem I have is I'm I'm always. I'm crazy about my readers. It's I want readers. I do. It's the same amount of work, whether if I get three readers or 3,000. So, and I have a lot of readers who are like woke cancel culture. So they're the ones that come after me. Sometimes they'll go, well, I'm, I'm going to refund this book because you're a Christian. Right. And that, that, of course, drives me crazy. It wouldn't drive me crazy if I had more Christian readers to back me up. I'm always like, where's right. the families? Where's my right. my right center, right leaning people? And they're just they they are not as into um, comic books, video games, graphic. And it could be just because. They have families and they're right. normal or something, but the, yeah, their disposable income is yeah. not as yeah. But um, so. I always, I always think that they would be my most sympathetic audience as far as if they read it, they would probably enjoy it the most. I'm very pro family, pro father, um, pro the good in my books. The the salvation message is buried in most of my work. It's so deep that you know I I try not to put it right on the surface. I think when people, if people catch you preaching, it's, 
that's no good. Well, I think it's totally fine to bury themes in your work. There's yeah. a difference between hitting people over the head or disguising yeah. a sermon as entertainment. I yeah. mean, your it's stuff is thinly, entertainment first. It's, yeah. yeah, it's not thinly veiled or anything right. like that. It's just I just believe that the the superstructure that all of our stories generally have is you usually have a hero who has a problem, who has to go through an ordeal, who f- at the very end goes into a crisis and finds a moment of revelation or transcendence and is changed forever. That is the that is the one thing that the gospel has put in the Western love of story that isn't there, say, in manga. That hmm. that <clears throat> that outside of the Western tradition, that story structure doesn't exist. So that's what we're trying to hold on to. And as people try and experiment outside of that story style, you'll see worse and worse entertainment show up because I just don't think it resonates with us as readers. Uh, yeah, I mean, you do, you know, there is, there are archetypes and there's uh, there's certain beats that you can hit or, or, or whatever that, that will resonate very deeply with people. You know, one thing I want to address talking about, you know, uh, because comics can get very, it's one of those industries, one of those entertainment mediums where, where people's personal beliefs and ideologies can, can cause conflict and anger. Yeah. Doug's stories are entertainment first. Yeah. Okay, you can, if, if, you can be a Buddhist, you can be a Christian, you can be a, uh, an atheist, whatever, and, yeah. and you can entertain, you can enjoy them 100%. I, I have tons of atheists right. in my audience, and I right. love making them laugh and smile. Right, and that's that's your that's your core goal. You're not trying to trick somebody into buying a comic book that's really going to be the gospel. Like no. that's not what you're doing. No. Uh, in my, fact, my thing ahead. is, I I I and I believe this to the core of my being that that God ha- commands me to share the gospel with every fiber of my being, but He never says turn your job into the gospel. He never right. says, like, go lay a brick, go lay brick, a brick wall and, and hide John 316 into it, you know? Right. Instead, he's saying, be, build, if you're working for me under the Lord, you know, make the very best. Make the best you can, you right. Can. So picture storytelling as another form of brick wall making. To me, the gospel comes out of it just in its quality, beauty, mm-hmm. fun, entertainment value, and and hopefully embodying some of the things that are that we all that I'm Hold making dear. a case for, which is right. that. But to me, if I can just make someone laugh without right. being dirty, that's right. a huge victory. And we yeah. need more of that. You know, there's so that our our current entertainment spectrum has gotten so cynical and you know dark and and whatever. And it's it's okay to just be purely innocently joyful at the same time. But one of the things I was going to point out. You, you don't silo yourself off like this. This is what we need more of. You, an avowed Christian, can come alongside and work with an avowed atheist and put out a That's good right. entertainment product. We need more of that. That's right. Right, and, and there, my job you know, is still to witness to them offline. Right. We still have great discussions offline. Right. But I, I really take my inspiration from Chesterton on that. His best friend was George Bernard Shaw, was his dearest friend for life. An atheist socialist was right. one of the greatest Christian thinkers, best friend. And I'm just going, how how are they able to get along? Not just get along, but truly love each other. Chesterton right. never agreed with a single thing that George Bernard Shaw said or believed. Yet they would uh, go to the pub together. They would lecture together. They would uh, inspire each other creatively. And I just go, there's something about right. seeing the image of God in the other person, even when they're not, even when they disagree with you on right. pretty foundational things. We we're st- we still try to love. Um, we try and love them. You know, yeah. that's uh, that's the our number one mark is love. Right. And, and, and true, like there's, there's multiple, there's Eros love, there's agape love, there's Philo love, there's, there's all the different kind of love. And I just, you know, we need more of that where, you know, there's so much in entertainment industries right now where it's like, well, that guy 
uh, believes in red state politics, and that guy right. believes in blue state politics. So wh- I, how could you possibly work with him? Yeah, we're going to throw a big internet hissy fit and cancel your book. Yeah. and you know we we need we need more. Let's just all work together and put out a good entertainment product. Yeah, and yeah. no one is more furious with leftist politics than me. But I right. still cherish my leftist friends. Be- our example given by Jesus is to leave the ninety nine to go after the one. It assumes that one is lost. It also assumes that the shepherd went out out of love and for that right. lost sheep. And you can't you can't go out into the world and, and love lost sheep unless you go out into the rain. It's tough out there. There's a storm. And you can right. sit in the safety of the barn. And that has no interest to me. I, I like being on the front lines of culture. And I get lots of slings and arrows people try and destroy my career right. and all that. I'm just like, that is, uh, I'm lucky to get, I'm blessed to get right. to be here. I love yeah. what I do and I love people too much to sit in the barn. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, it, one of the things that, and uh, I may have even said this with you before, so I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but one of the things that, you know, God has changed me was he opened my eyes that other people are not extras in my movie. That's right. They're they're universes of their own. And and so I you know, I'm I, I love the person, you know, and, and like I see you as a person, like when when I see somebody that has a differing belief than I do, I see them as the person first and their platform is second. Yeah. You know, I mean, because platforms change. And and if we write everybody off because we disagree with, with them, we have to write off pretty much everybody. Yeah, we're going to disagree, and that's my, and yeah. you don't want to be a good little Christian modernist, right? That's a mo- a Christian modernist says, because modernism demands that you reject the person and hate them for what they believe. Yeah, and I don't. And you always hear Christians say, "Love the sinner, hate the sin," and modernism is different. It's it's if yeah. they're a sinner, if if they sin, hate the sinner, and and they don't even believe in sin, but they just mean if they, if they disagree with you, then they must be destroyed. Right. Yeah, That's exactly. Disgusting. It's like it's like tear them down over one difference. And I, I've seen people weaken their job, yeah. like let them build your brick wall. Right. It's crazy. Even, even though they make the best brick wall in town, don't right. work with don't them. work I'm, with them. Yeah. Even though they would come in, build the brick wall, never say anything about, you know, and just do a good job and leave. Yeah. And it, it's just crazy. I'll work with anybody i'm looking for the right. best people you're looking for the work you're you're not there to have a, a, a ideological you know debate you're you're there the right. first your first goal is to put out a good product it has to be number one best thing i know how to do and right usually i can find uh people who think the same but i never want like a whole christian team i've always on all my animated series too i've uh, loved hiring. I hired homosexuals and and uh, trans people, trans people, uh, atheists. Oh, um, I worked with a lot of Mormons, and I just see it as like, uh, welcome to the team. Right. Let's make something great together. And that's also my witness as a Christian is like, right. how do I conduct myself on that team? I hope I can show them there's a difference. It's part right. of my witness. Right. Absolutely. But, but what good's a witness? What good is your candle if you put it under a bowl? What good is it if I sit over in a Christian ghetto, right. have a Christian team making Christian entertainment for the choir? That that is right. that is not in my vocabulary. Yeah, and there may be there may be some people. You know, there's hey boy, we're getting into some theological stuff yeah. here, but there's there's a difference between a vocation and a calling, yeah. and there may be some people that are called. Like yeah. they feel called to make entertainment just for the choir, you yeah, know. I don't. And, I don't judge okay. those people. People who yep. make like October, uh, October Baby or Fireproof. Right. I'm I'm happy they're making stuff for yeah. the Christian audience. I'm fine with and Veggie Tales. I'm fine with that. That right. is not what I'm. Right. Here. You're. You have a different passion. A different Very different. I, w- yeah. I want to make a case. Right. I'm leaving the 99 to go after the one. That's cool. So let's talk a little bit more. What? Who is Bigfoot Bill, and why do people want to? get this new uh, project that you're working on. Bigfoot Bill, Finger of Poseidon, is the second book in a a multiple book series. It's a giant sci-fi comedy epic where, think of all the cryptozoological creatures out there, Mothman, Bigfoot. Uh, In this case, there's even Greek gods like Poseidon, uh, unicorns, 
Loch Ness Monster. They're all hidden in this deep state government facility where they don't want to get them out because they're threatened by their magic power. So they're, they're kept in this prison. Bigfoot Bill steals the finger of Poseidon, which gives him control of the Kraken as his slave. And he wears the Kraken as a costume to help him break out because he's trying to get out of the Cryptozone, which is in downtown L.A. And he, B- Bigfoot Bill's just a teenage Bigfoot trying to find his family that he feels still exists, even though they keep telling him that, all the big, that he's the last Bigfoot alive. Right, he doesn't believe it. Yeah, so it's kind of, uh, uh, you know, his big goal in life is to meet his family, and that comes in future books, and, you know, like all good stories, it's not going to be what he thinks it is. So in, in his naivete and his great love, so he's very naive, very loving, very funny, big and goofy, and then with the wearing the Kraken gives him, like, almost an indestructible power. This being was made in Haiti, so Bill is very good, and the Kraken is not good. I'm not saying right. he's evil, but he's, uh, you know, he represents uh, the underworld and all that. And and so, uh, to me, it's like an allegory of all of us carrying, um, coming from darkness, right, and, find, and finding the light. And but Bigfoot Bill's innocence him being set aside and kind of the chosen one makes him just a bright light in this dark story it's why i had it take place in la is it's uh all of these these beings are all lost um and the government's after them and poseidon is this frankly evil um demigod trying to get to the pacific ocean so he can flood the earth is his goal. So they have to stop Poseidon from getting to the Pacific Ocean. And it, in this second book, that's what the main story is about. They're in a race to the Pacific Ocean trying to stop Poseidon. And if he touches water, you know, he can grow to be a giant kaiju, which, you know, Great. Ellswick and I are big kaiju fans. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, you, you can't go wrong with me with a kaiju. So yeah. uh, I, love, I love a kaiju. In fact, I've been on a kick recently watching... Godzilla movies with my son. So. Oh, they're they're wonderful. Yeah, I yeah. love Godzilla. And you'll see a giant kaiju fight in this uh, in this book. That's and in in Shadow of the Mothman too. It ends as you know in a giant kaiju, kaiju fight. Yeah, with, I've, uh, I've got Bigfoot it. Bill right and the here. Mothman are yep. giant in downtown L.A. fighting each other. Full center at the Staples Center. Yeah. Uh, so I've got to give a shout out to my friend Justin Mobley, who comes on the show sometimes. His nickname's the Mobley Detective Agency. He put this into my hands. And oh, said, cool. you, you, you have to read this. So um, I did not get in on the crowdfunding for the first Bigfoot Bill. Well, but if you go I'm, back yeah. in now on Bigfoot Bill 2, there's, there's, a, there's a, a tier that you can back. You'll have to put your credit card number into Indiegogo when you back right. this tier. But you can get Bigfoot Bill 1 and 2. And I'll deliver nice. them both to you in August. Well, it's, it's a beautiful book. I mean, obviously read it. But even if you don't, if you just left it on your it's coffee, a coffee table, table book. It yeah. looks great. I mean, it's beautifully designed. And the the art and the style and the energy of the of the uh, art is. If you like Earthworm Jim art, art artwork, you will yeah. you will like Bigfoot Bill. It's a very similar. I'm a vibe. classically trained animator, yeah. so I know how to draw. Yeah. In fact, I could see, and I, I you I I am just saying this. You haven't told me anything. I could see Bigfoot Bill being a video game just as easily as Earthworm Jim. So yeah, yeah, we're we're always pulling those strings too. Working, yeah, uh, I'll be pitching it to Netflix and and pitching it as a video game and all that. It takes yeah. a long time to do that. That's the yeah. thing is it's not like something that happens overnight. But it's gonna eventually it'll go. It just takes yeah. time. Well, I mean, he's even got the <clears throat> the tentacles for the platforming action and all that. If it yep. became a video game, so and I love the, I love the combination of this determined yet still naive, basically teenage Bigfoot. Yeah. Uh, so there's your innocence combined with this Kraken thing. You know that it, it, it's a great combination. Harbinger of yeah. doom. <laughs> and he's so Bigfoot Bill's so naive that even in the first book, you know. His best friend is uh, Agent Beckner, who works, who is a bad guy in the Cryptozone. Doesn't realize he's a bad guy. He doesn't realize he's working for bad guys, but he's just a government agent. And Bigfoot Bill kind of, 
kind of asks, are you my friend or is it your job to keep me in this prison? And so their friend comes in out in question and we find out, and that's Beckner's kind of B plot is, is he a faithful friend or is he doing this for the money and is he going to burn his friend, burn so this that's, being who trusts him? So that's his struggle. Yeah. Yeah. That's his internal crisis he'll come to. Well, that's fat, good stuff. Uh, what else, So what else do you want people to know about Bigfoot, Bill, too? We've, we're actually coming up on the end of our time, so I want to okay, make sure. Okay, sure. Yeah. We can wrap it up. All uh, I want you to do, I don't need you to buy the book. I need you to look at it. So go to Indiegogo and put in indiegogo.com and put in bigfoot bill and just look at it and uh i i think the book has to do its own job of making a sale i don't think i can right i can pressure people but i do i love every reader i have i will send you a great book and just to, even if you just look at it thank you i appreciate that i i would love to find um some people that that love great books is what i'm looking for and people who who like slightly higher minded comics is what right. I'm looking for. So go check out Bigfoot Bill to the finger of Poseidon on Indiegogo. Uh, I'll put that in the show notes uh, oh, cool. f- for the folks that are listening to the podcast or Krypton radio version of the show. It will be in the show notes. And uh, so you're and you're, you're currently working on delivering earthworm Jim Two. Yeah. I'm, I'm currently I'm writing earthworm Jim Two, So that comes out. Uh, I'm going to probably launch the Indiegogo for that mid to late oh you're writing okay you're writing it i have to write it and draw yeah you just you just company. delivered earthworm gem one so you're, you're writing that's right you're writing, I'm always writing the next book coming yeah out. so i might i have the note cards here i'm surrounded by a hundred note cards and i gotta write yeah. that script and anyone who knows anything about writing it is not very fun it is easy to procrastinate so <laughs> writing so i'm going to give you a tip yeah at that one point when you're trying to bridge those two cards and you can't figure out how to do it. That's right. Just have him say groovy. 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 And that'll uh, just that when would you're actually right work. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything to say like when he first is born, you know, and he sits yeah. up so he just goes groovy. I think groovy would be great. Just groovy. No, but it works. Yeah, that's where his catchphrase came from. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So he came out he came out like the tick the tick was born shouting spoon. Yes. Yeah, spoon. Uh, yeah. Uh, Earthworm Jim was, was born saying groovy. Are there any other projects? Cause I know you're always, you're, you're, you know, you're, you have your feet in many uh, yeah. industries. Is there anything else that you'd like to mention right now that you're working on or that's interesting? That's what I'm staying focused on. I do have a YouTube channel. Uh, if you look up Doug to on YouTube, you can uh, watch a few shows. I have a, we have a podcast called Audio Mullet that I do with Ethan Nicole, who writes for the Babylon Bee, and Michael J. Nelson, who does Mystery Science Theater and Riff Tracks. So look up Audio Mullet uh, on iTunes, and you can subscribe to that. But really, I'm just I just love um, I love writing the writing what I'm writing. I am going to okay. pitch this in Japan in May. I pitch the television series to. Uh, Netflix Japan or something like that. So I'll be meeting some business partners out in Japan just to see what they think of. Ooh, I wonder what the books. Japanese word is for analid. Cuz it'll probably uh, be, it'll be yeah. I think it's it, Mimizu. It'll be Super Action Mimizu. That's right. Yeah, Super Action Mimizu. So I'll, I'll bring yeah. and, I, and there's nothing better in a pitch than to give them a hardbound book of Earthworm mm-hmm. Jim and Bigfoot Bill and say and and it's just a beautiful great yeah. job. That's what I like doing is look, I brought you a gift. Yeah, and it's so, a pitch. Yeah, and it's a pitch. It's a pitch it's wrapped a pitch, in a. See? It's a pitch. See, wrapped in a gift, wrapped side in an enigma. Of, side of the mouth. <laughs> they're, going, they're, going, oh, they're going. Oh great! It's another gift. It's a pitch. Yeah. Oh great! They have like a ho- this huge. Yeah, they have a pile like, of yeah, fling. Gifts. Yeah. The the gaijin gift pile. Yeah, fling. Like, yeah, it's a chopper. <laughs> No, no, they'll be so riveted immediately yeah, by what they see. Chop. Someone brought us a slap chop. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they'll be like, they'll be like, oh, this is such different quality. It is unique. Do not put it on the pile. Do not put it on. That's right. Let us on the coffee table, people. Yes. Let us review it. So, all right. And the last thing I wanted to ask you about with your first Earthworm Jim uh, project, you were doing this wonderful thing where you were getting books for the people at Beale Air Force Base. That's I just right. how did that turn out? It was wonderful. Yeah. Um they had a 
so this is Beale Air Force Base in Sacramento, outside of Sacramento. They had me design the nose art on a KC-135 uh, refueling plane. So I did the nose art because he was a big Earthworm Jim fan. So I did a big uh, Uncle Sam holding the earth up uh, and he's all buff. And so I just fell in love with this base and all the people on it. All, all the, the um, our, our uh, service men and women were so kind of buttoned down and so wonderful and so respectful that I go, I'm going to send each person on all 800 members of that base, a free copy of earthworm Jim. So I, I had a, one of the tiers on the Indiegogo was for people to back big, uh, Beale air force base. I sent every service member a copy and, uh, they loved it. In fact, a hundred copies got inserted in theater when they were over in the Middle East refueling planes that one of them might just have taken out a certain Iranian warlord. What? With <laughs> that had Earthworm Jim on the plane. And I got a certificate <laughs> saying that. So just maybe. Wow, just, that is just maybe. Just they just, they do all the refueling, so they're yeah. just absolutely amazing. Um uh, the so. adventure, the adventures of the annelid continue. I just love to say annelid, annelid. Yep, annelid that's worm. That's the phylum of a worm. Yes, sir. So, uh, listen, you annelids. Here's how it's going to go. See, change. I don't. Yeah. Why are we talking? I don't know why we're talking. It's fun. So, oh, all yes. right. And you, you were saying. I don't, I don't. I think we mentioned this off the air before we started recording. That you have a you you have an experiment of a nightly YouTube show that you're going to start running. Yeah. That's yeah. right. I'm, we'll have you on as a guest. We'll do it. Uh, it's Monday through Friday, and it's at nine o'clock central. Um, it's called uh, Night of the Doug Show. <laughs> Night of the Living Doug. Night of the Doug Show. We're going to have you on. I do. There's men who talk. Good men. Yeah. Happy. Yeah. We yeah. have a puppet. We have a unicorn puppet that comes on. That's what's the unicorn puppet's name? His name is Zippy. <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> telling you he's the funniest he's the right. funniest thing i've ever seen yeah <laughs> I, I can't hold it together when he talks he's, he's all right sounds great okay so start checking out uh night of the doug show monday through friday on doug's youtube channel uh at 9 p.m central yeah, just go to go to Doug Tenaple on YouTube and subscribe. Yeah, check it out. That's the way, that's the way to do it. We'll All get right. Shane on too. Shane's that, going on. That's going to be fun, and I appreciate the invitation very yep. much. Quick footnote that the Night of the Doug show is actually on temporary pause for a few weeks, but do check out Doug's YouTube channel. The Night of the Doug show is so funny, uh, and there's other content coming there all the time. So we need to... Uh, uh, I want to, I want to, again, folks, Bigfoot Bill 2 is crowdfunding right now. When does the crowdfunding end? I think it ends in a month and a half. Okay. So you got people, you got plenty of time to jump in there. Go check out Bigfoot Bill 2 on Indiegogo. And, uh, and, and when you see it, it'll do the rest. You'll be like, of course I want to, of course I want to support this. This oh, is great. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll blow your mind open. It'll be a blast. Get cracking and get on over there. Oh, oh, crack. oh the cracking joke. So Release the cracking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Release All right. Well, yeah, re- we got to say it sideways. Release the cracking, see? Release the cracking, see? Yeah, we're talking this way again. <laughs> yeah. Hey, boys. It's time to release the cracking. Like James Cagney. Right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, boss, are you sure you want to release the Kraken? Hey, when I say release the Kraken, I mean release oh. the Kraken, you you mug. Right now so. you bug. Oh, the curtains, they're adorable. <laughs> it's my favorite uh, Bugs Bunny cartoon. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah, oh, the little the short. They're adorable. The little short guy. Yeah, uh, he's the best. All right, I got to wrap it up. Doug, as always, it's been a pleasure. You're always welcome on the show. Uh, this has been Doug at 10 Naple. Earthworm Jim, Bigfoot Bill, many other wonderful, fun things. But right now, the main thing is remember Bigfoot Bill 2 is crowdfunding on Indiegogo. And that's the answer. That's the answer on 101.1 FM. The answer. All right, Doug. It was a great show, see? Thanks for coming on, see? Yeah. God bless you. Thank you. (laughs) All right, man. Thanks. Thanks so much. Anytime, anywhere, man. Uh, Cool. And one thing I didn't get a chance to do with Doug while we were recording was the bad joke of the week. But I had one picked out 
especially just for him and Bigfoot Bill. And here it is, baby. What do you get when Bigfoot walks in your garden? Squash. Groovy. Why? Watch Bugsy. Don't look at me like that, Bugsy. I'm your pal, Bugsy. Your buddy pal. Yeah. It's Clayton's for you, Rocky. Clayton's. No. No, not that. No, no. Clayton's, you understand? Clayton's. Head. Oh, they're adorable. Groovy. Shane Plays Radio is blessed to have sponsors, and we appreciate them very much. However, did you know that you can also support the show as an individual? For as little as $1 an episode, simply go to patreon.com slash Shane 